In today's episode of Vice Versa, we're talking about a new lithium ion battery breakthrough, the first electric autonomous container ship, Lordstown Motors running out of cash, Ohio becoming a huge solar panel manufacturing hub, and more. And as usual, I'm joined by Ricky Roy and a very special guest. Do you want to introduce him, Ricky? Very special guest. So all of us met for the very first time at Fully Charged Live in Austin, Texas in 2019. Yep. Believe it or not, that was over two and a half years ago at this point. But this is Robert, who we met. Robert, why don't you tell us what you were doing at Fully Charged and your cool... Yeah, I was there. I was presenting a electric Suzuki motorcycle that I uh, converted from gas to electric. Um, and I uh, had my Zero there and uh, bought it out and took it on the track, and it was a great time. So It's awesome yeah, to have I you with us. Tell- <laughs> Absolutely. I remember him telling me he bought the battery cells from a Nissan Leaf yep. with seven miles on the odometer. Some guy shakes the hand and says, thank you for this brand new car, like pulls out of the lot and crashes into a tree or something. And that was that. <laughs> yeah, it, it was actually it was in the winter and he uh, he slid it on the ice and put it right into the barricade just outside of the dealership. Made it really easy for uh, for salvaging the vehicle, but uh, <laughs> it sucks to be him. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's awesome so, to have you here. Shall we get... I appreciate it. Let's start, jump right into it. And uh, by the way, for the people watching, our fans, uh, email us and let us know. We, we want to start having uh, guest viewers, so we'll definitely do that. Let's jump into our first story. I think, yep. Robert, you're kicking it off. Yeah, sure. So Nanograph has come out with their new 18650 format, um, which is really cool. The, the important thing about them is they actually say they've got an 800-watt-hour uh, silicon anode based cell um, and that in itself is is great it's roughly two and a half times what the current Tesla 18650 has um, now the, the reason that that's important is this is actually strongly backed by um, the US Council for Automotive Research um, which is powered by Ford and General Motors and FCA uh, I know how much you love FCA, uh, Ricky. I'm a big um, fan. <laughs> and, but they gave them seven and a half million dollars for a development project, and this was the outcome of this. Um, and they spun off and they created Nanograph. Um, so it's really a great thing, especially because everyone is using the 18650s now. Everyone from vaping to the cars, um, through you know electric bikes and and all the other projects out there. They're all using 18650. So any time that we can get a, a more dense battery cell out of it, the better it's going to be. Um, so it's going to be really good. And the fact is that they've done this improvement in less than three years. Um, so it's it's great. Um, the, the other thing about it is they're also going to be using that for uh, powering offshore. They're going to work with a, a group offshore uh, to build up the... Uh, power bank offshore uh, using wind turbines, um, and that'll be just off uh, off my home coast in uh, in Houston, Texas. So it'd be great to, to see those going up and uh, get those going as well. So this is a really cool one because we talk about all these home run technologies. Um, I, whenever I do videos on this new battery will add range to cars, people love those videos. I think everybody's thinking what comes next. But the reality is there's a lot of optimization to be had with our current lithium ion. Uh, first and foremost is our anode, our anode choice, which currently is largely graphite. The, the benefit of moving to silicon is that it's far more energy dense, like much less of the anode would have to be dedicated to, much less of the battery would be dedicated to the anode, and you could store as much lithium. So the cathode increases in size, the anode shrinks in size, the energy density goes up, it's a win-win. The challenge, of course, is that uh, silicon anodes, anodes, I keep saying anodes, anodes, anodes um, <laughs> will expand on charging. So that's the difficulty is volumetric expansion, which is not a good thing for batteries. you got to really keep them in, in some uh, compression. But there's there's been some breakthroughs with various um, technologies to kind of mitigate that and increase our percentage of silicon, which, which, is, which is kind of the, the game changer here. And I like to see companies making tr- breakthroughs with our current stuff, as opposed to like everybody being pie in the sky. I'm I'm, I'm all <laughs> for, for like thirty or forty percent pie in the sky, but I like a little bit of <laughs> yeah. in the yeah. real world. My 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 big question is I'm, I want to make sure that they they know that they've got. Uh, that I'm sure they have, but th- make sure that they've got the heating for charging uh, taken care of. You know, because thermal expansion on cells like that 
is is a big thing i mean that's one of the big things with with tesla is the 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 heat mitigation on those packs so it'll be really interesting to see how they how they handle that yeah it's it's, it's there's been so much research around silicon as the anode like there's so many companies that are doing this it's really interesting to see like this is one of the kind of the first ones that's kind of getting some press and news right now where there's so many companies that are still yet to come. So it feels like it's just the beginning of a wave that we'll probably see over the next five years or something like that of more and more battery companies coming out with batteries like this. So it feels like there's kind of like a little bit of a leap in uh, progress we're about to see in battery technology where it's been kind of a slow roll for the past decade. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes forward out of this. Agreed. I'm not sure if this sort of tech is going to make its way into EVs anytime soon, but yeah, maybe in the next couple of years, uh, that might exactly be what happens. Ready for the next story? Yeah. All right. So we'll jump over to meet the world's first electric autonomous container ship. Uh, this is from a company called uh, Yara Berkland, and it's been delivered to a Norwegian fertilizer company. And it's they've been working on this for the past several years, but it's an all battery autonomous ship and for me the more important part of this is not the autonomy it's the electric side of it. it's battery electric container ship which there's been a lot of like could you do that well here's an example of one um the maiden voyage they did uh, went was a seven hour journey from brevik to horton which is about it looks like i looked on the map is about 100 kilometers or so and it's going to be ha only hauling about 40 to 60 percent of its capacity until the end of the year as they're kind of like working out the kinks and testing it but the interesting part is the battery is in the bottom of the ship and act, acts as the ballast. So it doesn't have a separate ballast system. So it's kind of a clever use of that extra weight that it needs for the battery pack. And uh, as far as the autonomy side of things, it has electric cranes, which will automatically load and unload equipment when it's at port. It'll, of course, drive itself to the port. It's like you technically will not need a human being to do much of anything on this, which, of course, has its pros and cons because... That's going to take people's jobs, but it could make this for a very efficient means of transporting shipping. And the important part to remember is 90% of the world's goods are moved at sea. So the more of these that we get on the sea, the better. So what do you guys think about this? I, I really like it. Um, and the really cool thing that I like about it is actually, so um, the propeller system that it uses is something called an Azipod system. Well, this is Azipod 2.0. Uh, which is called Azzy Pool. So instead of a traditional Azzy Pod, which actually pushes uh, the ship through the water, it actually has turned the Azzy Pods around and actually pulls them. So instead <laughs> of you know pulling the, it basically pulls the ship from the from the back. Um, that's really great because it reduces uh, consumption by a drastic amount. And so you've got now a great pro uh, propeller system with a great ship that's running on all electric. And the efficiency on it is going to go through the roof. Um, the other one is, of course, the autonomous docking. Um, we're a little bit easier, I think, than uh, than a SpaceX Dragon capsule, but uh, <laughs> still a great, great way to do it. So I'm I'm hoping that we'll see some more information about it. Uh, be nice to see some some videos of it actually moving around in the power um, in the future here, Ricky. Yeah. So I like the idea. I like that they're proving it out. But I mean, the problem really for me is. Imagine how many cells this thing would require. Right? I'm thinking it's going to be in the order of... Gigawatts, at least. Right. I, I'm thinking you might be able to make, like, 500 EV vehicles, like passenger cars, with the same amount of battery supply. So, invariably, for me, what it comes down to is, like, a passenger vehicle has limited space, has fit in your garage. There's limitations there. So, I think we should go with the cutting-edge stuff, the lithium-ion battery, the most cutting edge varieties, especially keep those for the passenger vehicles, the really where space matters. And then for this, I, I think quite a few things could work here. Uh, Matt has done a video and I have it on my board for like modular nuclear reactors, right? Like small scale. You don't have to have like, it doesn't have to be a naval, like a Navy aircraft carrier, but smaller scale nuclear or might hydrogen have a place here. Um, I, I did a video recently on aluminum air batteries, which is not really a battery. It's more of a fuel cell. It has to be recycled, but which I think uh, for these kinds of larger applications, we should be thinking about, if nothing else, at least like, you know, we can go with like iron, uh, iron phosphate batteries instead of like really cutting edge nickel chemistries. But 
we should be thinking about what other ways more, like less space, volumetrically efficient ways can we go leaving the battery supply for the cars, which really have no other option. We're not going to be seeing cars with hydrogen, I don't think. Yeah, any, but I mean, what they way. could do is they could do something like using cobalt instead, um, which aren't straight on the cutting edge, but they cobalt? still, uh, yeah, uh, lithium magnesium cobalt instead. Um, and using, you know, something like that instead of uh, the, uh, one of the other cells, so. Well, Robert, you brought up an interesting point about the propellers, like how it's going in reverse. If that's so much more efficient, why are they not doing that in that was, other ships? It's like... That was my first question. So <laughs> the, they, they are slowly getting there with, with other okay. ships. So um, the... Um, I'm trying to remember the, the ship's name now. Um, it was actually one of the first commercial... Uh, ships that actually had an azipod system on it um and it was developed for using a um uh, in a commercial system and they they noticed the efficiency was off the charts um and they were wondering you know why it was um uh the ship was called the elation oh that's it the elation yeah um it was that's right um it's one of carnival's cruise ships um, and they were wondering why it wasn't using as much uh, fuel to, to, to sail uh, between, uh, uh, I believe it was between Florida and uh, the Bahamas. Um, and they actually took on engineers to actually investigate why it was. And um, <laughs> they, they realized, well, it's actually just, it's that efficient. Um, but it also requires a complete regut of the engine bay. So that's, uh, that's one of the things about it. So, Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, hopefully we'll see more of that just no matter what the fuel source is, whether it's a hydrogen or nuclear or battery. It's like it seems like we should be moving to that no matter what the fuel source is. Yeah, I think we need a champion like Tesla has been for the passenger vehicle and the lithium ion battery. I mean, just look what Tesla's done in two decades with the lithium ion battery. It's wild. Nobody could have predicted what we'd be able to do. But I feel like we need a champion for the larger scale applications like somebody tesla-esque who can come in with aircraft and large freighter ships in mind and say let's talk about the future of what we we want to do because i really hope that it's a separate thing speaking of cobalt and some of these things i mean you know there's there's a huge cost associated with all this stuff and there's going to be a huge demand you can imagine how many companies are going to be you have an r1t reservation with rivian i mean the number of companies are just getting started so um i hope there's some other alternatives out there. Also, the autonomous part. You mentioned job loss, which is interesting. <laughs> um, that's got to be a much more uh, low-stress, low-key challenge to solve than like a self-driving car. It's like, go straight for six hours. <laughs> um, so that should be fun to see how that comes along. But again, cost of goods decreasing and um, overall kind of a win for all of us. Yeah. Exactly. Ready for the next one? Yeah. So uh, the next story up, we have, uh, it's kind of a sad story. They've, they've had some challenges as Lordstown Motors will require additional capital to continue. It's kind of a dire situation, and they've kind of made that clear. This is the endurance, their kind of you know, commercial pickup truck that they've been showing off for a while. And uh, they showed a $125 million loss in Q1. You know, they don't have a product yet, and they've got employees and, you know, commercial spaces to pay for. So... Uh, it's going to be pretty tough. And so they're going to require additional capital to implement our business plan. And it may not be available. um, So on acceptable terms, they say. And so they're they're cast into a little bit of doubt about their future going forward and if they're going to be able to actually pull this off. Um, They mentioned that a lot of their beta vehicles um, were supposed to be wrapped up and the testing was supposed to be uh, through and they should get into a larger scale rate of production. But part of me says, like, you know, Doing this is really tough. Building cars is tough. And they've had to do it during the probably the most brutal, terrible time any company could possibly try to do business, which is during COVID. Um, we've seen supply chain disruptions to everybody. There are like Ford vehicles that are not being produced right now because of chip shortages and other things. So um, I, I, part of me says I, I, I don't know that I've seen enough for them to, to, to really be excited about them. We don't talk about them very much. And building a car is tough, and I'm not sure if every single company will survive. Um, I'd love to take. I'd love to hear what you guys think um, about Lordstown. We've talked about trucks a lot lately. Is there 
I mean, are they going to survive? Is there? Do you think they've got what it takes for the you know the, the inroads to be able to pull this off? Yeah, it, it was really interesting because you know everyone when when Lost Town came to market, everyone was like, "Well, GM's going to back them. It, it doesn't matter. They've got a, a blank slate that the GM can just back them." Um, and you know, it's now of course coming to fruition that they they don't really have the backing that they thought they did. Um, now, having said that, their stock did rise uh, quite a little bit after this announcement. It it tanked a little bit and then it came back up. Um, but it uh, it definitely put pause on the fact that they didn't have the resources available. Um, I mean, you know, other car makers, you know, Rivian, for example, has done it where they've got they they've they've been real secretive about it. So we don't know their exact financials, but we we can all estimate that they're doing really well. Um, Ford, for example, you know, with with the the new Lightning um, that they they're coming out with that one, they've got almost a hundred thousand reservations already. A um, little bit of back uh, back of the napkin math, you know, a hundred thousand reservations times a hundred dollars per reservation. That's a cool million that's banked ready for that. Even if you know three quarters of them, you know, only came, you only got three quarters of them to actually come to fruition. That's still three quarters of a million dollars. That's a good chunk to to get some some base backing going. So, yeah, my my take on this is a little more pessimistic. I I think their future is really in question because the fact that they're running out of money so close to when they're supposed to be launching the the truck and they're cutting their production by like fifty percent, it's doesn't instill confidence for a company or people to come out and buy that truck because it makes the you that. that they may go out of business and then what do you do with your truck at that point? So it's like, it's going to, I think, have a chilling effect on sales, which yeah. I think it's just going to be a snowball going downhill. It's just like, there's, I feel like it's an almost an un, unstoppable thing at this point. I hope I'm well, wrong because I, I want more competition, but I just feel like they're not long for this world. It, it reminds me a lot of Ulta motorcycles. Um, the fact is that they came out, Ulta motorcycles came out real strong and heavy. I mean, they came out with four product lines um, they had, I, I want to say it was almost a million dollars in pre-orders. Um, they got the first, I think, 10,000 units out the door and wrapped up, uh, wrapped up shop and walked away. Um, and there were people that were left with, with no orders available. Now no one can get parts, no one can do anything. And they've got these, these lumps that are just sitting there, um, that are, are dead. <laughs> so. There's there's one more part of the story which is really unfortunate for them because I mean they didn't plan this, is the timing of it all. We've we've been through this really uh, kind of wacky roller coaster the first six months of this year. If you if you rewind time to January, there was talk about you know Lucid going uh, IPO via reverse merger, and so the SPAC game was was all the rave. Everybody was trying to go public via that route. And CCIV particularly being this really uh, speculative stock with a lot of excitement and buzz around it, that was like the moment the bubble burst was with CCIV. There's, I mean, the SPAC is a $10 holding company, and their shares were trading at $60 a share before they finally announced, and it came crashing down. And to me, that was the moment when this entire SPAC bubble kind of burst. So to be honest, consumers, I don't think they have the stomach for this at this point, because yeah. I mean, Lucid wasn't that different. They were engineering complete. They were ready. They were like, hey, we have this factory. We got to get this up and running. We need to go get ourselves a couple of billion dollars to get started. But they raised funds and went public. I think Lordstown, the, the people, the underwriters at Lordstown are probably thinking, guys, we can't do that right now. You don't want to do that right now. Trust me. And I think it's fair. We're in a wild west. We're in a new frontier with electric vehicles. And we'll look back in 10 years and there's going to be tons of money made, tons of new companies. But there are these waves on this roller coaster. And I think right now we hit a peak of excitement and buzz and hype and speculation. And now we're at this kind of low point where we need some come these companies to come through. Rivian, where are you at? We need to see the trucks on the road. Lucid at some point, they've been really quiet. So when those companies emerge and we see them kind of turning around to profit, I think we'll return to where we were before. But right now there's probably a little bit of a cold snap on the EV investment front is my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. There's going to be a little bit of a graveyard of like corpses of failed EV companies in the coming years. And, yeah, and Lordstown could be one of those. So who, who's going to take the next story? 
Great question. Great question. Um, why don't you, uh, right. Matt? Sure. All right. So Ohio is about to become one of the largest solar factory complexes outside of China. And this one, this got me really excited when I saw this in the news. It's a company called First Solar that already has a footprint here in the United States and produces about, I think it's a third of their solar panels actually produced here already. But they're basically going to double their production in the U.S. And this facility is going to be a 1.8 million square foot facility. And it's going to be producing about one solar panel about every 2.8 seconds. <laughs> just that's an astonishing amount of solar panels to produce. And China, of course, is the just like the dominant player in this space worldwide. So to have some real competition kind of being built up in the United States is going to bode well for what we're trying to do here in, this, in the United States, trying to build up our solar infrastructure to have more facilities here with American jobs, producing American panels that are being used in the United States. It's going along that whole path that, you know, Biden is trying to do a self-sufficient energy independent future for the United States. Every country is trying to do that. So this is going to be about 500 jobs here in the United States, and it's set to open, I think it's in the first half of 2023, and have a full capacity about two years after that. And the other interesting part of this is that their thin film PV panels don't rely on, was it, crystalline silicon, which is mostly made in China. So even the components they're using are not going to rely heavily on China, which means that's a good thing for the, the whole production flow of the business. So this is kind of a big news for the solar industry. What's your take? I, I think it's a great thing. Um, I mean, I've got panels on my roof, and they they definitely, um, they, I believe mine came from, from Taiwan. But, I mean, it, it's good to bring everything back. I think we've we've had a, 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 you know, a lack of ability to have everything here in-house in the U.S. Um, and bring that all back into house, bring that all here. To, to work it here in the states, I think is a great thing. So, um. yeah, the this this story, uh, Matt, if I'm honest, is my favorite story of the week, and it's something that we've talked about before. I think the pandemic really kind of shined a light on how vulnerable we were because we've been so so happy to just offshore everything in the interest of eight percent better margins and stuff. But I think what we've what Tesla has shown me is manufacturing is kind of the sexy thing not it's not like a necessary evil along the way it's the thing it's the thing that you could really take pride in we used to do that and at some point china decided that they were going to do all the world's manufacturing and it left us really kind of vulnerable it, the early days we couldn't even make masks which is embarrassing like we as a country every country should have manufacturing capabilities that are um, you know, that are stout. And we, I think we realized just how shorthanded we were for the first couple of months. There was shortages of everything. So this story, I think, will be kind of a, kind of a, a pendulum swing the other direction where we should do more uh, manufacturing in the U.S. And companies that get on this train early are going to be in good shape because there's going to come a point when China will no longer be a place you can go because Chinese labor and cost, um, Chinese salaries are going up, and eventually China is going to start turning us away, just like they did with our recycling. You know, China was our recycling. I don't know what they did with this stuff, but they took all of our recycling for a long time, and now they don't, and we have no idea what to do with it. And they'll do the same thing with manufacturing eventually. They'll have their own huge companies and their own huge things, and they're going to be like, oh, we don't have, we don't have time for, for you guys, plus the cost will be almost on parity with U.S. labor. So highly automated, really, you know, streamlined manufacturing in the U.S. I think is going to be huge and it should be exactly the kind of thing that Biden is looking for. I think this, you know, they mentioned that this is exactly what Biden is on about and for good reason. My only concern here is about you mentioned the thin film. The thin film is way less efficient than like the, the, the especially the monocrystalline structure PV. Yep. So um, I'm hoping this isn't like just kind of random use cases of flexible like for example you could you could uh contour any vehicle like the roof of your car with these flexible panels but i mean the output is nothing compared to like the kind of panel you have on your roof which is a either a poly or mono uh, uh structure silicon uh, panel so i'm hoping that they don't just limit themselves to that that they do yeah. all of the above eventually but to your point about supply chains and covid we don't know but this is a huge first step i, I hope i my excitement, I hope, is clear because I really think this is cool. It's good yeah. news. 
and it leads really into the last story. Do you want to take the last story? Are we up? Yeah, sure. You want to get into this one, Robert? Sure. Um, so the U.S. is going to be taking some major steps here very soon uh, to work on um, increasing batteries and battery technology. Um, uh, the DOE, the Department of Energy, has set this goal for this new ambitious cycle of batteries, um, and they've they've done it with some really cool grants. Um, they've got a seventeen billion dollar grant from the vehicle manufacturing loan uh, system that was put out, which part of that has gone to places like Rivian and Ford to develop manufacturing on these big pack levels. Um, and then the other part of that is to strengthen the environment uh, that for manufacturing. Um, I come from a, a battery manufacturing background and, you know, this is this is gold to us because it increases our ability to say, right, well, we, we need first dibs on this cell or we need first dibs on this packaging. Um, and it gives us that ability. Um, so that's, that's really nice for us. Um, and also it's backed by Congress. That's that's the big thing is, you know, Congress is saying, let's get this through. Let's get this done. Um and it's going to be a 10-year plan to develop a complete domestic lithium battery supply, all the way from mining through to, uh, you know, moder uh, modernization, and then all the way through to production, um, which is going to be, you know, stellar. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah, this is the reason I thought this was so nicely tied together to the last story is it's all about creating, bringing manufacturing back to the United States to be kind of energy independent. And so here we have solar panel manufacturing being built out. And now we have plans for the battery manufacturing infrastructure to be built out. So it's kind of the one, two punch of renewable energy. You kind of need both of these things together. Um, or, or you're going to still be dependent on other countries for manufacturing like China. Well, I mean, e Elon started this already partially with his mining operations that he set up. Mm -hmm. um, and finding, I think it was four or five mines, you know, here in the U S that he wanted to use. Um, so he already had that going. Um, and now we've got, you know, big government backing behind it as well for other companies to, to pick it up. So I think that the, 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 the train is just going to start rolling straight ahead. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what comes out of that. And hopefully, you know, it brings a dramatic price reduction down for, uh, future battery cells and future battery starts. technologies. Yeah, yeah, that's always a first step to, to bringing these kind of prices down. I totally, totally agree with both of you guys. This is a really huge uh, step and a, and a big story. It it kind of starts with what I, I mentioned the previous story about manufacturing and Elon. Whenever I see these events, by the way, we have uh, the Plaid delivery event happening in a couple hours. I don't think we're going to live stream that one, but in the future, maybe Maddie, you and I should kind of coordinate and see if we could uh, live stream so you guys could watch it with us and get our feedback and stuff that we can share. But when I see Tesla events, what I always walk away from is, man, Elon, I don't think he cares about cars or solar panels or batteries. The man loves manufacturing. I think when he's in, in that factory and he sees one robot hand off to this and there's a person having to do a step, he, he sits there and goes, why can't we automate that? And I think it drives him crazy. And I think he obsesses about it. He kind of got him in a little bit of trouble with the Model 3, trying to over-automate where... A human could easily do the job much more quickly or simply. But I think Elon's obsession is nothing to do with cars or any of this stuff. I think he obsesses about manufacturing. And this is what I was saying about make manufacturing sexy again. Instead of this kind of evil that we have to have and go offshore, who cares? It could be the kind of kind of the source of pride for, for communities like it used to be. And there's tons of innovations left. And again, I, I credit Elon and Tesla for coming up with it like these huge giga press machines, right? Yeah. Where have where have the car companies been in terms of innovating the manufacturing side? A lot of companies just, this is manufacturing, this is what it is, and we just keep doing it day after day, but they keep asking, what if we could do this? What if we could do that? Could we get rid of all these welding spots and make it one casting? And they're, the end result is pretty killer stuff. So yes, bring. I think manufacturing should should come back to the US, and I think we need to be leaders on like the most cutting edge, automated, streamlined manufacturing processes around the world to the point where you really couldn't afford not to just get it made here. That that could be a future reality for us if we make the right investments in robotics and, and AI and stuff. This is also something that needs to be happening around the world. It's not just here in the US. It's like the EU has been doing things like this for years now. They've been a 
couple steps ahead of us as far as policies and things like that. So it feels like the U.S. is finally kind of playing. It's playing catch up. We're playing catch up. So it's it's about well, it's, building all this out for everybody because we all need to be kind of energy independent. Yeah. I mean, you, you're going to think that the last time that the U.S. actually had a press like this in their midst, you know, that they actually had the, the capability for was at the end of World War II when they stole it. Well, they, they didn't steal it, but they took it back from Germany um, because that was the two biggest presses in the world. Germany had them uh, for casting magnesium um, for the uh, uh, during the, world, the, the war effort. And so because of that, they actually, as part of the uh, replications, they actually gave up the two presses. One of them went to Japan, the smaller one went to Japan, um, and then the bigger one came to the U.S., um, and when that one came to the U.S., that was the biggest press in the world. But Germany already had plans for one that was two and three times as big, but never got to build it. Um, and now we have, you know, the, the Giga Press in, in, in Texas and the Giga Press in, in Fremont. Um, and both of those are, are championed by Elon. So, you know, that's the last time that really the U.S. had that big of a press um, at its disposal. So, Very cool. It's the future there's innovations to be had yeah um and it will be companies like this that figure it out yeah well that was the last story of the night so we could just jump into the q a section of the show if you want to start taking questions and i see you you've been over there typing away <laughs> responding <laughs> to people I ha- yeah <laughs> i have been you know we you guys noticed we didn't even mention the plaid delivery so because i mean it's literally hours away at this point what are we gonna yeah. ha- speculate for one hour or something but Let's let's go and jump in and talk about it. Actually, what do you, what do you think is going to be announced? Like, do you think there's any going to be any big surprises in the event, or do you think we basically Ooh. know what they're going to show? I think we pretty much know what, what they're going to be showing. Um, you know, the the plaid one point one seconds to uh, sixty uh, cold thrusters. Um, be interesting to see how it happens. Uh, Ricky and I were talking about it earlier. You know, what transmission? Are we actually going to see the first ever EV transmission? Uh, you know, a, a two-speed transmission system. Um, I mean, granted, a two-speed transmission, you lose a little bit of power on the on the low end, um, but you could gain that in your high end. But if we're having that instant acceleration from the cold thrusters, we may actually, you know, <laughs> we, we, we may have it back. So it's going to be interesting. <laughs> so... I was, I was gonna say there's there's been a lot of speculation about there's gonna be yeah. some one more thing, and it's like I keep thinking there's no way they're doing a one more thing. They're not going to announce anything that's not the Model S because that would take the news away from the Model S. So there could be actually, surprises about the Model S. But I don't think there's gonna be any new car announced or anything crazy like that. I actually think <sighs> there is gonna be a one more thing. Oh no, I'm, I'm with I'm no. with Ricky on and this so, one. I'm, so I'm, hear me I'm out. With hear, Ricky me out. On this. Oh. Hear, hear me out. Hear me out and tell me if if, if this makes sense. Okay, here's why. Here's why I'm I'm thinking that. First of all, um, I'm cu- to, I, if and this might be unpopular. I'm currently very underwhelmed because they canceled the Plaid Plus, which is um, a lot of the Tesla fans are already kind of coming to their defense, saying, "Oh, the Plaid is going to be so great." Yeah, but I'll tell you what, the Plaid isn't going to have is 500 miles of range, which is why I like that Plaid Plus all along. Was imagine an EV with 500 miles of range that also happened to be a supercar. To me, that's wildly interesting, and now that's gone. So to me. They've already backpedaled, so they're coming into an event with a car that's, I mean, it's almost identical looking. It's not different at all, really, looking looks-wise. Interior's been refreshed. It's going to be great. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the Model S, and I would, I'd would i get one. If I had all the money in the world, I'd be getting the Plaid Plus. I really wanted that car, that car particularly. But um, to me, it feels like they're coming into this, like they're stumbling into this, <laughs> They cancel the Plaid Plus. There's probably reasons for it. They'll probably get into it. The car is not radically different looking. It's almost identical. People try to make it seem like it's so different. I can barely tell them apart, to be honest with you. I look really close. I'm like, okay, fine. That's a little bit different. So for those reasons, why have an event at all? This is a car that's really fast. That There's not a whole lot to say. This is not a new product. Everybody can imagine, okay, my car, my Model S, my Model 3 performance is 3.2 seconds. This is stupidly quick it has an extra motor more power um it's going to be a fun thing but why have an event for that i think they're stumbling into this and there's something they're going to do uh somebody in the comment section mentioned maybe an fsd um an fsd subscription and they launch it or they show it or something 
that could be it. Maybe yes. Powerwall 3, right? But, um, but that's the thing is like, I do think they're going to have a surprise or they wouldn't be having yeah. the event. But I don't think the surprise is going to be outside of the Model S. It's like whatever they announce is going to have some tangential connection to the, the Model S. That's kind of where I'm at. So it's like, it could be full self-driving related. It could be about the battery. It could be about the range. It could be whatever. It's like, but I don't think they're going to come out and go, and here's the Model 2 or... And the Roadster is going to be available next week. I agree They're with not going to do any of that. That'll so. have its own thing. I agree yes. with that. I agree with yeah. it's not going to be a bombshell like that. But the, I mean, the plaid. This event is to me. It's starting to feel very humdrum. It doesn't feel special or interesting. It's a car we've seen for like ten years. That's going to get faster, and it's always gotten faster. There was the. Well, to be fair, they did have like the D, the dual motor. They had an event for that, and then ludicrous mode. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, it could just be that, but. To me, that sounds like it'd be a little bit underwhelming, and I, I think there's there's got to be something well, it, that it, they're gonna th drop on us, right? In the comments, uh, Duncan, he's clearly in my mindset. He's just like anyone expecting a surprise is going to be let down. That's kind of where <laughs> that's kind of where I'm at. It's like if you're expecting uh, Apple one more thing that's gonna be just completely off the wall, you're gonna be disappointed. I, I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be more reined in than that. Okay, can I bring up one more point? I want both your guys' inputs on this. Uh, we were at SeaWorld earlier with the kids. We were hanging out, and I brought this up. And no, I haven't heard anybody talk about this. Will the Model S Plaid have a more than one-speed transmission? Well, like all of our cars are one-speed. All the Teslas besides the original Roadster have been. Will that carry on with the Plaid? I bring this up because my Model 3 performance is an absolute monster from 0 to 70, 70 miles an hour. Like, no one's touching me. After 70, the car is very pedestrian. It's a it's a fast car, but everybody else will beat me after that. Like, all the AMG guys after about 70 miles an hour. And the reason why is I don't have a second speed. So that people like to think electric motors are infinitely flat. They're not. They spike right away, and they, they drop off. And if you... I can Let me look for a picture. When you guys talk, I'll try to pull up a picture of one. But the torque curve does drop significantly. And... Also, there's a red line of, you know, let's say 17 or 18,000 <laughs> RPM. And those are the factors you have to play with. If you had a, if I could switch it to second gear, my car would have like new life in it. But that does wildly complicate things. My one speed gearbox will never have to have oil changes, never have anything happen to it. There's no synchros or meshing. I get all that, but go. Discuss. What do you guys think? Let me pull up a torque curve. <laughs> so, uh, you, you want to take this man, or do you want me Wait, to, you go, to you go, you, first? You, you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I'm I'm on the, I'm on the 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 alternate side of that. I don't think it's going to have a. I think it's going to stay one speed, and here's why: because with a one speed, you with the addition of the the third motor. So, uh, a friend of mine, uh, in fact, the guy from White Zomb uh, White Lightning, uh, which is the drag truck, um, he has got three warp nines in there and literally just by engaging a button he gets the additional motor to, to kick in um and so you get that power that comes on basically at stages um and i think that the third motor in the plaid will actually do that i think the third motor is going to sit there in docile mode for the whole entire time right up until you get to the point you need it and then it'll engage the third motor and that'll be the kicker that goes for it so that's just my opinion on it yeah, I don't. I, think, I don't think they. I don't think I don't they're th going to go for a, for a transmission. I don't think they're going to go for a transmission either, because that kind of complicates things. It adds more complexity, and they're all about stripping down yeah, complexity. So can you? Uh, uh, Let me share your screen. Can, yeah. So this this curve here. Can you see my? Can you see that curve? Yep. So uh, this is not a Tesla motor. This is a motor of MV two fifty five. But you can tell it's electric because look where it starts. <laughs> yeah. Right. This is yep. beautiful. But look what happens. Um, so my car at, um, so my Tesla Model 3 performance has a top speed of 140, let's say. Yeah. So at 70, it's halfway. Um, and Teslas have, a, I think, 18 or 19,000 RPM red line. So you're falling into this kind of part of the curve. And uh, that's the argument is you're, you're, you're not getting the torque you used to have. Um, and this is where, like, you know, gas cars have it, <laughs> seemingly more and more and more gears. That way you can stay in the fat part of that curve. Um, well, and also, also to, to that as well is, you know, motors run into motor fluxing, which is where the motor physically cannot actually generate any more power at that point. The, mo the motors, the magnets inside the motor are completely saturated. 
Mm. And so they lose field uh, win- uh, field strengthening. And because of that, they're able to, to drop out. Um, and that's where they, they don't have that anymore. But I think that, you know, by adding that third motor in line with it after a point, it'll it'll super saturate it and it'll allow it to, to get that, that additional burst. So that's the one cool thing with having three motors is you can have different gearing ratios. You can have three motors, a single speed transmission. Um, and just for clarity, all Teslas do have, what I guess you can call a transmission. There's a gear reduction set, but it's a one speed. There's no... There's no clutches or slip discs or there's no, you know, there's no synchros. It's just a constant one speed. So if you have three motors, I mean, yeah, you could have that third motor laying there with a very tall uh, gear reduction for higher speed stuff. Um, and if they were all really powerful, that could work. And I do think that's the route Tesla is going to go. But part of what makes the Taycan such a monster. Um, and anybody who's driven like a Model S, which is a very fast car, and then you drive the Taycan, to my mind, the thing you're noticing is that two-speed. It's not that the Taycan has more powerful electric motors or anything else, but that two-speed is is where I think the Teslas I've all driven, and I've been in the P100D ludicrous mode Model S, um, north of 80 miles an hour, they, they're not the supercars they were before that. Um, so I, maybe I'm splitting hairs, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Well, they should address that, though, because... If you're calling this a supercar, you got to chase the likes of those supercars out there. Well, Katie, Katie brought up, uh, they're setting up a whole track for the event, so it almost looks like they're going to be doing some racing. So going back to my, there's not going to be cr- no crazy one more thing. This is probably going to be purely focused on the crazy performance of whatever the Model S is going to be, whether it's third motor or second gear. It's like it's clearly going to be focused on that. That's That's where my hunch is. Even the choice of track will be telling. Um, the more <laughs> twists and turns you have, the electric car will win because, you know, you slow down late, you can generally brake and mechanically brake, and then every turn out of the corner, you can speed up like a bat out of hell. Uh, the, the more st- long straights you have, that's where the gas cars will pull out. Yeah. So if you, if I think you guys both spent time on the track at um, the Circuit of Americas in Austin. That's exactly what I found happened is one of the guys I met took me out on his, on his Taycan and in all the, in the slow speed curves, we were, we had everybody. And then as soon as the track straightens out the, the GT3 RSs and all these like really, really super, super cars and McLarens and stuff would start pulling on his Taycan um, up there. So, and I think what I talked to somebody and they thought, oh, that's the, that's the problem with electric vehicles or electric motors is they're really fast at slower speeds, but then they lose that. No, that, there's, nothing, there's nothing inherent about that. It just comes down to the gearing of it and like the design of what you're building. Are you building a 200-mile-an-hour car that you expect to be driving over 140 consistently or not kind of a thing? But there's nothing inherent about the electric motor yeah. that makes it any wor- I mean, it's better in every way because it has a huge range of torque. Uh, there's no gas car that has an 18,000 RPM red line. That was more than my motorcycle <laughs> yeah. had. So, um, yeah. Kitty yeah. Green's calling you out again. <laughs> so, yeah, I saw that article. Um, yeah. It, there's a complica- there's complications to it. And I think the difference is the Rimac is truly a supercar. Uh, I don't think they need to have... Uh, yeah, I, I, I did read it. Uh, somebody mentioned it on Twitter as well. And I was reading it while we were waiting in line and stuff at SeaWorld. I didn't go all the way through it. But, yeah, fair point. Um, they did. It is far simpler, and that's why I think Tesla will really try not to do it. Um, but if you're building what you're calling like a supercar, there's just expectations there that like, oh, econ- uh, the economics of having a tr- those go out of the those go out of the way when you talk about supercars. That's kind of my argument, I guess. Right. Oh, and the ubiquitous. We have 266 people watching and we only have 86 likes. Hit that, hit, is, that, hit that like button, guys. Come on. <laughs> it's, help it's a help us thing. out. Just, just, just click on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Matt and I have worked very hard to make that like button entirely carbon neutral. So yes, you're we welcome. Have. <laughs> it's a carbon capture device. Every time you put, push it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you guys a question. If, if Matt and I, and, you know, Robert or other guests in the future, if, if we covered events in the future, like let's say Volkswagen Power Day or a Tesla event, and we live streamed it and we we had it right here on this channel. Would you guys tune in? Like, Is that something that would be of interest to you guys or, or, or would you not care? Um, I can I can say that going either way. 
Yeah, let us know. So uh, Dusty says, economics go out the window when your car is over $100,000. Agreed. That was kind of my point earlier. And Chris says, Rimac, front gears are different than the rear gears. That's true on even like Teslas and stuff. Like there's differences between the rear and front motors. Um, so that might be the way they do it. Especially because at low speeds, like you're not, the, the problem isn't the motors. It's just grip. Yeah. Like, you know, what they've done a great job with is like moduling, modulating the power to make sure that they, you don't even trip your wheels. Well, I have to this day never like even squealed my wheels. And I just, it's just like perfection, the launch. It brings in the power just right and, and, and raises it up. So that way my, my wheels just don't spin. And it's pretty cool. Well, you, you, any anytime you've got a dragster, you know, the, the first six feet are always going to be your slowest because getting just that initial grip to, to turn um, is what, what kills it. Um, and getting the, well, not just the inertia, but actually getting the, the tires to actually grip on the on the cement as they're, they're rolling. Uh, that's what kills it most of the time. So, And you think it's not hard? Try chasing a husky at six miles an hour and telling me if they're, they're getting away from you. It, it, it happens quickly. James says Ricky is using more and more creative segues to get likes on his channel. Um, James, I'm not going to lie. I think I'm at about like 25% of my research and writing time is just on uh, <laughs> integrated like into this thing. <laughs> he actually has a whole entire list of them that I can tell you. It's about 300 li- items long on how to get a like for a video. So, yeah. <laughs> so Bong says I have chirped my standard range plus all the time. Uh, Bong Hollywood. I'm surprised by that. Now, I have actually not used track mode yet. I Maybe the next... I should, I should have done it while you were you should here. should have done it this time. <laughs> um, you know, kind of the, the pandemic happened, and so I didn't really get a chance to get to button well or anything. But, yeah, my car is, like... I don't think I've ever heard the wheels chirp on that on that car. Curious. And stay tuned, because I'll tell you whether or not I can make the Rivian wheels chirp, because I guarantee I will make them chirp. <laughs> so, by the way... Yeah, Matt, I think the next time we'll have him on will be when he takes delivery of his R1T. And he's an early reservation holder. Oh, yeah. nice. He booked it in 2018. So I, 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 I was, I was uh, December 2018. I, back before they changed the algorithm to detect it, uh, I figured I was reservation 3,800 or change. You're so going to be one of the I'm, first. I'm one of the first few. Um, I should, you know, my, my guide, if you're, if you're paying attention... I'm waiting for my phone call. You can just call me over today. We'll take care of that. <laughs> and we actually kind of joked if, well, no, it's not a joke because when I joked about it with you, I had a full-time job and now I do not. Or I, I won't shortly. I was saying if, you know, what if instead of taking delivery, we fly out to, where are they? To Dubois? normal Illinois. No, yeah. normal Illinois. Um, right. So, yeah, we, we talked about that. But the fact is that because of COVID, they're not letting anyone come up to the factory. Got it. Um, but they have said that now in multiple releases that there isn't there may be an option for for delivery in in normal. So I would be totally fly getting up for and, flying and up to do a little video series and, and drive video, it down videoing to, it to home. Houston. So yeah. yeah, and via of course a detour out to California. <laughs> Dusty Green says, "What's the fastest speed anyone has gotten their Tesla up to?" I'd love to hear the answer to all from all of you guys. I hit a hundred miles an hour and I chickened out and I slowed down uh, one time on the five. <laughs> but the nope. fastest I've ever done is 138 in an old M3 many, many years ago in college. Well, okay, so are we keeping this as a stock Tesla or are we take it, uh, going to the outside world? Well, um, no, I'd like to keep it with the people here right now in their okay. cars. I'm sure there's some guy with some crazy Tesla who's got... Well, there's, there's the Pikes Peak Tesla, right? Uh, which has gone, you know, ridiculous. Speaking of, uh, speaking of which, uh, YJK, thank you for the super chat. Um, really, really awesome. We love seeing you here. He says, just a big thank you. This podcast really makes my week. To the legends watching this, don't forget to like and subscribe. Yes. Um, thank that you. That is awesome. <laughs> yes. That is awesome. This is a man who's read the book, How to Influence People and, and Make Friends, or whatever that's called. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So, oh, look um, at this. Chris says he actually achieved 139. That, that's the record to beat right now in chill mode. That that took a while. <laughs> okay. Andrew says 142 Model 3 performance. Andrew, what was it like? Did, did it just totally dry up? I'm wondering if you're basically redlining that motor probably around 17,000 RPM at that point. Um, I'd love to know. 
And then Hugh comes in, the scholar, with his uh, with his metric system. Yeah. I don't even know what that I'm means. I'm American. I don't know what that is. 166 <laughs> kilometers an hour. It's probably like, what, I'm going to guess like 120? Yeah, it's about about 115, 120 or so. It's pretty good. So far, Andrew Kaler is the uh, is the is the time to beat at 142. That's actually got to be. That's going to be tough to beat. Um, Andrew says it was smooth, but he backed down. Yeah, I can imagine. That, that's pretty. That's pretty quick. So while we're on the topic of speed, you know, what's the fastest you've ever been, period? So <laughs> when I was, I went to Berkeley, I went to Berkeley for college and I had some friends and cousins at USC and UCLA. So we would kind of drive down and vice versa. So there was a particularly long night when it was late in the night and there was no one around. I had my high beams on to kind of look for cops. And so like in clearings where there was no overpass or anything, anybody who lives in California or knows the five, it's like. 300 miles of straight road with not even a like a not even a um, a tree in sight so yeah i just kind of cleared the last overpass and i was like all right there's nothing coming up and i just floored it in my 1997 m3 that i had it was a five-speed manual i love that car and i hit 137 i think <laughs> my God. Okay. and you get the tunnel you get the um the tunnel effect they call it right yeah uh tunnel effect tunnel effect where yeah, the, the the world just seemed to be passing me by so quickly that my mind, it was beyond the ability of my mind to comprehend is what it felt like. I'm sure like if you're a race car driver, the more time you spend in that zone, you'd get comfortable with it. But man, it. Yeah. And, I, and I, having said I've that, one... obey the speed laws, everybody. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> do not do, do that. that. Do not Thank do you. that. So, so the adult, here's my disclaimer. The I did that the on the track um, and <laughs> I did it at 147, actually at Circuit of the Americas wow. um, on the bike that I built. So uh, that's that's mine on there. Much more responsible. Thank you, the adult in the room, uh, Mr. Farrell, as always, for, for jumping in. <laughs> I have to say that because the fastest I ever went, I won't say how fast I was going, but I got caught and pulled over. It was not pleasant. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Through a speed yeah, trap. Uh... Three, three cop cars pulled me over. It was great. Ouch. <laughs> Bong Hollywood says 125 in his Volkswagen R32. Is that a GTR? I believe R32. GTA. Um, 98 yeah. at Laguna Seca. So that is a track that I want to visit. I actually had reserved Button Willow, which is three hours north of like, LA, kind of between San Diego, uh, between LA and the Bay Area. There's a really cool track out there. And they have this thing called Tesla Corsa for anybody. I think Bong's probably been to it. I think maybe Andrew as well, probably. But Tesla Corsa, where it's a, like a weekend just for EV drivers. And you could go out there and put your EV through the, through the paces. Uh, really, really fun. I actually had a reservation for Tesla Corsa to cancel in April because of COVID in 2020. Mm -hmm. I'm dying to get it back out there because I have a performance Model 3 and I've never even turned on track mode. I'm dying to do it. I can't wait. Here we go. Play it safe, guys. Ride a unicycle. Yes. <laughs> there you go. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jose Santin says uh, 240 kilometers an hour in a BMW 5 Series in Spain. I know Jose's from Spain. I got to pull that up. I'll tell you the roads in Spain um, are incredible compared to uh, the roads here in the U.S. So that's about 145, 146 miles an hour. Okay, so that's pretty fast, uh, Jose. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. The, the roads are Way nicer in Spain, I will say. And very few cops. From I, I drove about 2,000 kilometers in Spain a couple of years ago. And I think in my entire 14 days in Spain, I saw one police officer, I think. <laughs> not Again, not, not that I'm encouraging any sort of behavior. We do not encourage this behavior. No. <laughs> we, we do not <laughs> Don't go to Spain. Speed. However, speed. if you do, send us a link. <laughs> now, Jose is a man after my own heart. He says 300 kilometers an hour in a Honda CBR6, uh, CBR 1000 RR. In Spain, I, I have a I had a CBR 600 RR for many years until um, my wife told me she was pregnant. But love those bikes, and that is that is scary on two wheels. I'll tell you. Yeah, I've I've got uh, quite a few stables, uh, horses stabled, and uh, my my Ducati redlines at about uh, 350 kph. So never got it quite that far, but uh, I've I've pushed 250 on it. But that was in in dyno, so. Ruby says 160 in a Civic Type R Mark II. I like those cars. Those are those are awesome. Wyoming's got to be a pretty good place to put your yeah, car. Yeah, it's just flat. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what do you guys think about the um, the event? I'm kind of curious. I, let's hear like a bold prediction from somebody in the audience. We'll uh, maybe the winner will give. We'll do a giveaway or something next week to the most crazy bold prediction that turns out to be uh, accurate. While we wait for that, Bong Hollywood said, my bucket list is going to the Autobahn, smoking a cigar, renting a supercar. <laughs> Bong, when you do that, you let me know, my friend, because every like part that. of that sounds amazing. Uh, <laughs> count me in. Yeah, the Autobahn sounds pretty great. As someone that's driven on the Autobahn, I can attest that it is just that great. So, didn't, didn't smoke a cigar, but uh, did, did uh, take an M3 through the Autobahn, so. And by the way, a lot of people were saying that they would watch a live stream with us watching an event. Okay. Um, th uh, somebody else mentioned there's a lot of people who do this. That's kind of what I was thinking. There are a lot of people who do this. Mm -hmm. um, but they're probably not as handsome as Matt, Robert, and I. That I'm going to go off the limb and say that's probably <laughs> going to be tougher to find. Well, you, you, you're a little burnt today, Ricky. So, I you know. <laughs> I was I was hissing to him before today in, in, at, at uh, SeaWorld. <laughs> yep. There's a lot of sun, man. See, this, this, is, this is what four hours out in San Diego does Absol to you. Absolutely. <laughs> So Rob Womack is saying uh, 4680. Then we have, okay. uh, let's see, was it uh, Dusty and Dan saying Roadster? Yeah. Um, so Coach DA says Plaid Plus was canceled because Roadster is ready. And Charlie Fox says the Model S Plaid already has the 4680 installed, as you mentioned. Uh, makes sense. I, the Roadster... Um, I have a feeling they're going to push the roads for out. Um, Andy Sly made this joke on Twitter uh, earlier today. I got to pull it up. It was so funny. He's like, predictions for the event. Elon comes out and talks about how bonkers the performance is and how amazing it is and the 4680 cells and that the Roadster has been delayed till 2040. <laughs> 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 and I kind of think they will do that because, first of all, they owe a bunch of free ones to people. And yep. the last thing a car company is dying to do is start up a line where they're going to go give out, like, hundreds of cars. Mr. Farrell is going to get, like, 1.7 Roadsters. I don't know how the, the decimal work will work. You're going to get the, the, the front, like, two-thirds of a car. They'll give me the steering wheel. That... <laughs> 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 so I, the Roadster, I think, is they're going to – I don't think they're going to make that for a while. I think they need to figure uh, – need to increase the, the lines for, like, the Y – Cybertruck is going to be huge. That's coming up. I think those are going to take priority. Yep. People don't buy Roadsters. I mean, the people who are going to get them will be the people who are getting the free ones, but like, there aren't that many people buying $250,000 two-seaters. And to the people who've said, oh, that's why they're canceling the Plaid Plus, I call BS because the Plaid Plus is a five-seater family sedan that you can put into comfort mode and just enjoy about town. Yeah. And then when you want to, flip a gear and go, go crazy and bonkers. Okay. We uh, have the most crazy prediction. All right. You ready for it? I do. Apple, Apple CarPlay. What? <laughs> <laughs> John, that is bonkers, yes. my friend. Whatever yes. whatever you're... I, I uh, think we need to just send John something anyway for <laughs> just that comment alone by itself. All right, yeah. Uh, John, if, if they add Al Apple CarPlay... Um, maybe some merch or something. We're going we're gonna to give, give you something. Um, that is wildly probably not going to happen. That, that's great. I like that one. And yeah. Coach, I agree with Coach Da. Everyone's so crazy about the four, forty six eighty. I don't think it matters if they can get the performance. So like people yeah. are too focused on the battery. Fo focus on what they're trying to sell, and it doesn't matter what the battery is. It yeah. just goes to show you, Tesla fans aren't really car people, which is the the thing I've noticed. Um, the average car person, I think, is harder to win over. But Tesla people are technologists. They like cutting edge and breakthroughs and research and science and. They get obsessed about the battery, but it's like, you know, when you get in and you drive, you're not going to be like, oh, man, that 4680 really, you know, really, uh, <laughs> you're not going to notice much. It's going to, it's largely an optimization, um, but there's excitement, which is cool. That's a cool thing. There's few car companies that can garner that kind of excitement yeah. for something so under the hood that you'll never really well, notice. I mean, you know? to, to that point as well, the, I, I don't think the 4680 is going to be that big of a, a thing because they've already said that the MIT... Um, the, the Made in Texas uh, Model Y and, of course, the Cybertruck are already going to run on the 4680s. So they're coming out of, you know, their, their lab testing and they're already ready to go for production. 
So I don't think that that would be the, the big one. But it would be really interesting to see about it if they if they do put the 4680s in there. But to your point, you know, it is about the performance. Who who really cares? I mean, ultimately, they could put double Ds in there. Yeah. But, you know, as long as you actually get a, a cell that gives you the performance, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, the 4680 is probably the biggest benefit. It's probably going to come to Tesla in production costs. It's going to yeah. increase their profit margins. Agreed. The actual performance, it's like for us day to day, we're not going to notice. The other thing too is whenever you talk about Tesla fans, about Tesla events, I, I, I'm going to say 70% is investor interest. It's people who are thinking about things like par- profit margins. Whereas the average car guy watching like a car unveil isn't thinking, oh, that new front fender is really going to drop cost 8% yeah. and <laughs> year over year growth. They're not thinking about that kind of stuff, right? So yeah. that's a fair point. Here's a good one. I like this one. Um, Jose, again, um, who I think Jose, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Jose is a new um, channel member of mine. So I appreciate you, Jose. And also Gary, who's a channel member, who uh, just did a super chat. He says, we will, uh, will we ever see a S plaid high speed endurance test run on track at 150 miles an hour until it switches off? I'm sure someone will do that. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> there probably will be. Um, I think, yeah, that, that'd be fun if I got my hands on one, I'd, I'd do it. But Jose says, what about an app store? I like that. Is that what you're I've thinking? Been, yeah. I've been talking about an app store for a couple of years now. They need to do it. You know they're going there. It's just a matter of when. It's like, and one of the things that Elon had said when he was asked about this a long time ago, he had said, oh, it's too early. You know, when we, maybe when we get more cars on the road, they have a lot of cars on the road now. And so it's like, I think this would be a perfect time to bring out an app store. That would be, a good, that would be a good one more thing. That really would be. Yeah. And you know why? Because don't forget the one thing I think we've forgotten. You, you brought this up, I think, two days ago at dinner. The Plaid Plus, the new interior, they've got the new a- AMD uh, x86 yeah, the new, uh, infrastructure, AMD, uh, architecture, chip, yeah. which Video they games. say is like a PlayStation 5 equivalent yes. in terms of processing power. So their GPU on board is also from AMD. Um, it must be something along those lines, something like based on the, was it the X5700 XT, something like that. So a really powerhouse uh, gaming setup. Yep. Which begs App Store. Here we go. I, I got I got I got one more one more thing. <laughs> one more and that thing. is that the steering wheel actually is an X, Y, and Z controller. Uh so when you're sitting there doing <laughs> supercharging, it disconnects the, the steering wheel and you have it as your joystick. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh the the yoke steering the, wheel. The yoke steering wheel yeah. becomes it a, pops a joystick off and then you can use it as a controller. <laughs> I think I think you win. I think you win just with that, that prediction. <laughs> Coach agrees with me about the Tesla tech mindset as opposed to car mindset, which is is very very interesting. I think. Um, um, YJK says, following Ricky's videos, what what if they reveal electric cars which use the aluminum body? as the cell and it gets scrapped when done <laughs> he's talking about my aluminum air battery video <laughs> that could be interesting you know who um, i remember famously steve jobs would always lease these like mercedes s-class cars yes. <laughs> and as soon as his license plate came in the mail he wanted full uh like anonymity he wanted yeah. no one to know who he was so the minute his license plate would come in the mail, he'd trade it in and get another one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I used to work at Apple um, right. a, a long time ago. And it was actually, it wasn't uncommon to see a car with a barcode in the uh, in the parking lot. And we're like, oh, there's Steve's car. And then <laughs> you'd see it with a license plate on. And the next day there would be a brand new car in that spot. And you're like, yep, I guess he traded that one in. <laughs> so this is, this is really funny. Um, Observer who uh, I appreciate Observer. Observer has been amazing on our Discord. He's uh, he's one of our uh, channel members. Uh, amazing insight he's had. He says, um, vice versa, Matt Ricky, Plaid can now double as a Bitcoin miner when parked. <laughs> 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 and somebody else mentioned Doge mining uh, app using the AMD hardware, which might be more likely. Oh, Doge is um, proof of um, stake, isn't it? Proof of stake, yeah. So they don't need any mining um, as much. Okay. Anyways, but it's still it's still it'll, a mineable asset. Sure, so. sure. Yeah, or, every or Tesla you, is now now going to be a giant uh, um, miner on the road. So, <laughs> or James Paul said, ejector seat for in laws. I'll pay extra <laughs> for that one. <laughs> you know, speaking of which, I think if 
whenever they make uh is do we need a new James Bond? Is there a new James yeah, Bond? Yeah, there's a new James Bond coming up. But the, we don't know who it is or is we, a new uh no, the next one will still be Daniel Craig. Uh, Daniel Craig, and then we'll have another one coming after that. Really? I thought his time was up. Okay, no, well, he, the he next James Bond should be whatever this unveiling is tonight. It never. Is that crazy? Never. No? Never. They had BMWs for a while. Those weren't British. They had the, the BMW the, the Z3s and the, the Z3s. Z8. Yeah. Is it for no, a while? They, they'll, they'll stay with, with, with proper gas burning cars because they need to cram. Hugh needs to, all the space to cram all the, Dude, there's uh, so the electronics space. in there. On, on those things. You see that whole pass-through door on the Rivian? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's that time of night. We probably should be wrapping up. Any other comments we want to pull in before we jump? Um, <laughs> I don't know if this is a joke or if this is true, but uh, Dan Crow says, if you're trading a Volkswagen, Tesla will give you a $1,000 credit. <laughs> Uh, that might that might just be true, uh, Volkswagen in particular. But um, hmm, so I have a video I'm planning on that. So I'm, I'm, I'll I'll think about that. Maybe I'll ping Dan. <laughs> but there are some. I think it's gonna be some cool gadget stuff on the inside. Yeah. And uh, so we all agree the wildest prediction is Apple CarPlay. Yes. Apple CarPlay, Apple CarPlay is the the wildest <laughs> one. Yes. Hands That's down. Winner. <laughs> So, uh, Corin Ross, we weren't planning on live streaming, um, which kind of sounds disappointing now, but maybe <laughs> next time. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe next time we'll do it. Yeah, let us know. Uh, leave comments on the video or like in the community section or something. Uh, reach out to us on Twitter or something. Let us know if you'd like us to do live streams. Uh, the three of us, this is pretty fun. This yeah. would be cool. I think this would work. Um, we'll, we'll think about it. Yeah, and thanks for joining us. It was so much fun to have you here today. Oh, my pleasure. I was I was glad to be here. Um, <laughs> so it was actually funny. You know, we were, we were walking around SeaWorld, and he was like, hey, do you want to do, uh, to, to do vice versa? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I'm here. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was a last-minute thing to come on. I'm glad I joined, so. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks Thank everybody. Thank you to all of you guys in the section, in the comment yeah. section. Thank you. Yeah, the co comments have been very vibrant tonight. And reminder, obey the speed limits <laughs> before we jump. <laughs> obey, <laughs> obey the speed limits and hit that like button. Equally yeah. important. Yes. Equally right. important. Um, I want to stress and, that. Yeah, I was going to say, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss an episode. We're live every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 uh, p.m. Pacific. And you can always listen to the podcast version of the show at vice versa.show. And as always, thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.